Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Rachel Rosen. I'm the Communications Director for Democratic Majority for Israel. On behalf of our entire staff, our President, Martin Melman, our board, our board of co-chairs are with us, Ann Lewis and Todd Richmond. Welcome. We hope you and your loved ones are in good spirits and are staying safe. Before I turn it over to our board member, Mark Gerstein, to introduce our distinguished guest today, I wanted to go over a couple of items. If you like what you hear today, if you like what you see, here's a, a graphic that shows you how you can follow us on social media. We'd be grateful for a like or a follow. We'll also take questions today. If you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A feature on the Zoom app. And if you're joining us on Facebook, you can submit it in the comments section under the uh, video screen there. And also, if you wanna learn more about DMFI, you can go to our website and please do consider signing up for our news and updates. And that's at dmfi.org. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mark Gerstein. Thanks, Rachel. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Gerstein and I'm a member of the board at Democratic Majority for Israel. We are honored today to be joined by Marav Yahid. In our session today, Marav will be discussing her report on how Israeli tech companies and initiatives are responding to the COVID-19 crisis. Marav is a technology and innovation advisor at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change based in its Tel Aviv office and her home today. In her role there, Marav works with the Institute's advisory teams across Africa to leverage Israeli technologies, knowledge and expertise to bridge the gaps and challenges faced by the governments in the countries in which the Institute operates. Previously, Marav worked as a strategist and online specialist at Google and as a content and digital editor and TV producer. She also admirably served in the IDF spokesperson unit. Marav holds an MA in innovation, in innovation and entrepreneurship. Marav, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Mark, for your introduction and your kind words. And hi, everyone. I hope uh, you'll enjoy uh, our discussion this evening. Um, if you don't mind, I'll begin by saying a few words about the Tony Blair Institute I work for, and then I'll present the report we published, uh, as Mark uh, generously said. So I'll begin by sharing my screen. And I'll wait for Rachel's uh, notion that you can all see my screen. Thank you very much. Yes. So, Thank you, and I'll begin. The Tony Blair Institute uh, for Global Change is a not-for-profit organization with uh, just over 250 people working globally on the most pressing issues the world is facing today. Uh, work that is uh, made possible by support from friends uh, like some of the people on the call today. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, then I'll, um, after that, I will go on to a short, uh, overview of the report on how Israeli tech took on the case of COVID-19. Um, and so a few words about the Institute's work that is currently divided into two main pillars of work. Uh, the government advisory work, where my colleagues are supporting governments and leaders uh, across uh, 15 countries in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and other some developing countries, uh, working again on uh, the most pressing issues that these countries are facing, uh, working side by side but with ministers and civil servants to address these issues and deliver the reforms. Um, and on the policy and thought leadership side of the policy futures pillar, uh, my colleagues are working to shape the debate and influence decision makers and policy makers around uh, issues like um, housing crises around the world, uh, privacy concerns of technology, and, um, and also extremism uh, around the world, which is a big part of our work. Um, I invite you all uh, also to visit the TBI website and social media if you wanna learn more about the content that we are uh, putting out there. And now for COVID. COVID came and changed all of our lives and all of our work. Uh, the way we work and also whoever thought we'd need to take care of uh, innovations to do with uh, uh, improving digital health, which is already quite remarkable around the world and especially in Israel, uh, mobility monitoring 
uh, and contact tracing that started uh, to be a very prominent word in our, in our daily life. Uh, sourcing medical devices and protective gear to support our frontline workers and medical staff, uh, supplying the growing demand to consumers, and also uh, various tech for living with COVID-19, mainly uh, to take care of uh, the, the um, medical uh, and uh, mental health uh, alongside with returning to our daily lives. Uh, so in this presentation, I'll attempt to give you a short overview of how the Israeli sector has tried to mitigate these new challenges that was introduced to our lives, that were, sorry, introduced to our lives uh, by this pandemic. Um, so the tech, the Israeli tech sector is already quite well known for being proactive and uh, in its ingenuity and, and readiness to respond. But these two uh, unique initiatives that were launched um, very much in the early days of the pandemic, in my opinion, have been a driving force. Um, one of them is the, the Directorate of uh, Defense R&D Unit in the Ministry of Defense that really harnessed the advanced capabilities of the defense sector. Uh, they built a, um, a cross-ministerial, cross-sector uh, um, national emergency team that was working with uh, medical staff, engineers, private sector, researchers, pretty much brought everyone to the table to find uh, the, the right solutions and the, and the fastest solutions to be implemented. And the innovation authority that put up call for uh, proposals and very quickly received 750 proposals, uh, out of which just over 30 companies received uh, grants totaling at $15 million um, last month. So a lot of new ideas and a lot of uh, very interesting pivots, especially of uh, companies that change their R&D and change their productions, addressing um, governments, healthcare providers, and individuals' um, challenges that the pandemic has faced. So one example of such a global need uh, is contact tracing. Um, contact tracing, for just briefly, for if anyone isn't uh, aware of that, of what it is, is uh, monitoring people who have contracted the disease, uh, the, the virus, sorry, and tracing them back uh, in order to uh, check the people who they came in contact with in order to notify these people uh, that they need to self-isolate or if they're showing any symptoms that they need to uh, seek help. Uh, contact tracing have been uh, addressed in most countries today. Uh, the most uh, uh, well, um, the, the, the most used uh, method is voluntary contact tracing apps, uh, which are limited in the way that they can support because they need uh, at least a high number of uh, adapters in order to, to do that. But there are also other interesting approaches to this, like uh, medical grade questionnaires that I'll speak of uh, a bit later, uh, radio logs tracking, so tracking of the uh, specifically directly from the uh, mobile towers, so you can uh, track it anonymously, and also various um, call center management tools that were pivoted into uh, working towards remote screening and reporting of uh, contact tracing. So one example of a company I'd like to uh, shine a spotlight on is uh, Diagnostic Robotics. Uh, their solution is really interesting because it's combining uh, healthcare with predictive AI, uh, which enables the solutions for both individuals, healthcare providers, and governments. So, uh, and they're already operating in Israel. They've been working with all with the Ministry of Health. So every citizen in Israel receives these questions every day. Uh, they've recently partnered with the Mayo Clinic in the US. Uh, they're also operating in uh, Rhode Island. Basically what they do, uh, their solution is, uh, in includes um, a symptom self-checker that you can see on the screen uh, that also monitors the symptoms over time. So it can alert healthcare providers of uh, cases that could become uh, critical or people that might be in need of a test or hospitalization. And then it takes that information together with the AI predictive layer that they have in their solutions to create these heat maps that can, inf that can uh, inform uh, decision makers in the way that they uh, decide on lockdowns, on, on uh, specific uh, measures to be taken. Moving on to the uh, larger health, health sector, health tech sector, um, that usually is uh, 650 companies. In this map, courtesy of Startup Nation Central, 
You can see uh, some 180 companies in Israel that are harnessing tech to combat uh, COVID-19. Uh, some of them have already uh, released their products and are operating in Israel and around the world, and some are still in R&D, but still quite impressive. And to most of the innovations in digital health, uh, the focus is uh, mainly on detection and diagnosis. There are various uh, solutions for that from remote detection of uh, uh, COVID-19 symptoms. Uh, there are ones using uh, robotics uh, radars. There are ones using uh, mobile cameras that can diagnose you just based on the upper cheek area. Very interesting innovations that uh, I'm sure we'll hear more of in, in coming years. Um, Vital signs monitoring, which is one of the most important things, in my opinion, for isolation words, um, to detect and flag uh, deterioration of patients six to 12 hours in advance, which really helps reduce the burden over uh, the medical staff and help with prioritization. And also big data analysis and AI solutions that are helping speed up uh, testing uh, and efficiency of uh, testing both PCR and uh, antibody testings, but also testing like CT scans that have increased massively because of the fact that the, the disease is uh, uh, harming the lungs and it's part of the diagnosis uh, system. Um, on the telemedicine side of things, uh, there's a variety of solutions uh, for remote care, both for the homebound, for Corona hotels, uh, for uh, people in, uh, in ICU, various ways to reduce contact, but also think solutions that will help uh, beyond COVID with uh, people in remote areas who, are, who don't have access to see their GP uh, every day or every week or every year. So one of the uh, initiatives um, that is doing, that is working on, uh, on uh, the, the, sorry, the telemedicine is TitoCare that you see on the screen. TitoCare has a remote uh, all-in-one examination device that is offering pretty much all types of checks that can be sent remotely to your doctor and then uh, they can um, decide on your, on your process of care. And uh, you can also see the cockpit system that is uh, one of the products that's been developed by the uh, Directorate for Defense R&D initiatives, which is a combination of the Soraka Medical Center and IAI, which is the Israeli aerospace uh, industry. So they have created this dashboard. Uh, it's not only a dashboard, but it's a system that can remotely collect all of the data from critical care patient. Um, analyze all of the data, get all the symptoms, analyze all the data, uh, and show this live dashboard in a secure place for the medical staff to be able to uh, do their work in a sterilized uh, environment. Another uh, global, uh, global uh, shortage and global concern uh, was uh, the shortages of ventilation devices. Israel was no different in the, in the first wave uh, there was a real scare that uh, we won't have enough ventilators um, to um, accommodate all the people in need. So this started um, two rounds of uh, efforts. One was repurposing of uh, defense companies' production lines. Uh, they repurposed it to produce ventilators and ventilation support devices. And the second one was uh, multidisciplinary uh, teams that were working between medical staff, engineers, uh, researchers to produce uh, and design simple ventilation support devices to make sure that the critical care patient in need of high equity uh, ventilators will have these uh, when they need it. And this, these, um, these simpler ventilator devices can be uh, supportive of the less uh, critical care patients. Uh, another race that uh, Israel is, uh, was not different to, from uh, its neighbors or around the world, is protecting frontline workers and the shortage of uh, PPEs or protective, uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, this led to a surge in, um, in initiatives in Israel for 3D printing. I think every school that had a 3D printer started producing uh, uh, face shields like crazy and delivering them to um, all of the hospitals and nursing homes. Um, there were also more advanced solutions like the use of biotechnology and nanotechnology in 3D printing for more advanced protection. And again, there were uh, 
multidisciplinary collaborations, mostly between university um, or medical universities and uh, the defense sector to address specific issues um, that doctors and medical staff were dealing with, like impeded vision because of the, uh, the masks and, and all of the gear and overheating. So they needed to solve that as well. Uh, two examples for uh, companies or initiatives. You see Ambovent, which is an example of these uh, um, simpler design ventilation support devices. Uh, this one is special because it's an open sourced one uh, designed to help developing countries around the world. They've had uh, just under 50,000 downloads uh, from teams around the world and they have 200 active teams building their own prototype. So hopefully they can help so save lives. Um, and Synovia is uh, an interesting company that made one of the fastest uh, pivots that I've seen. Uh, they are working on uh, fabric coating, uh, various fabric coating, and one of their solutions was uh, a fabric coating that is uh, making the, the um, fabric actively kill bacteria, viruses, and fungi. So not only protecting, uh, but also durable, um, and can be reused. So what they did was take that, uh, that innovation, quickly turn it into face mask, got it FDA approved, and they're now already selling internationally. So very fast pivot and very promising uh, solution. Uh, being conscious of time, I'll go over this uh, quickly. Uh, so logistics solutions are also uh, uh, a big concern because of growing uh, need for delivery to people stuck at home for well, quarantined or, or in hospitals. And there's also a lot of closures between borders and, and lack of uh, uh, safe and free transport. So legacy solutions were not really uh, up to the game. So uh, various solutions for contactless delivery, like unmanned uh, drone deliveries or even unmanned drone uh, operations of uh, sites like oil and mining sites. Um, there was uh, obviously local delivery management platform that sounds simple, but for businesses who weren't delivering, it was very, very uh, critical in order to stay, stay in business and stay alive. And also uh, systems uh, platforms that were helping matchmaking between importers, exporters, and finding the right way to, um, to ship these uh, products internationally. So before I wrap up, it looks like COVID is here to stay with us and um, we'll be leaving, living with uh, COVID-19 for at least another year or two uh, until we get the, the vaccine, the mostly anticipated vaccine. So the new challenges uh, that we have are really uh, um, quite remarkable and we need to find safe ways to return to our daily lives where it be going back to our offices, going back to uh, seeing the elderly, going back to going to the hospital for various things, uh, non-COVID related. So I'll just quickly go over and you can, you can read more about these solutions in the report. Uh, various uh, innovations for temperature screening, uh, to go back to offices, malls, uh, even parking lots that can, uh, can be uh, screened at once. Uh, touch-free solutions. Uh, there's one company also doing uh, harnessing sound waves, so you don't. But, so it can also work with uh, dumb phones. You don't even have to have smartphones in order to enter places uh, in a contactless way, in touch-free way. Uh, and you can also make payments, and you don't have to have a smartphone for. So that will be interesting to see. There are loads of robotic solutions um, to do with, uh, mostly to do with nursing and communication. Uh, there's a lot of emotional wellness platforms uh, for homebound people, for the elderly, and also for students, uh, how they deal with uh, this pandemic, because it's a, it's a completely different experience from what most of us have experienced going to university. Uh, and there's also uh, hygiene micro stations that, to help us keep our hands clean, uh, which can be deployed in, a, in every uh, office and uh, public sector, uh, public uh, space as well. So hopefully these uh, will help us go back to our normal lives quickly. And to wrap things up, I do believe that technology does have a great role to play, uh, both in mitigating the challenges of uh, this pandemic, 
but also beyond that uh, in overcoming gaps and creating a more inclusive uh, global world. Uh, I hope I managed to give you some insights as to what the Israeli tech sector is doing um, to help lead the fight against COVID-19 and improve the life alongside it. Thank you so much for listening and I'm keen to hear your questions and answer them. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Fascinating, and uh, I, we've learned so much from your presentation. I'm so eager uh, to get to ask you some of my own questions and to uh, get questions from the group. For folks who joined us maybe a little bit late, please do uh, submit questions. You can do it through the Q&A feature uh, on the Zoom uh, interface. If you're on Facebook, you can type it uh, into the comments box. And let me start, uh, Mirov. How did you uh, get the idea to compile this report? How did that come about? So... I would have to say this uh, This all started by, uh, first of all, the, the institute in its entirety has pivoted uh, with the start of COVID-19, like many other organizations. So teams around the world are working to support leaders and governments in their response uh, for COVID-19. And because of uh, the fact that technology plays a huge role in the institute's uh, work, both in, uh, especially in policy, of what technology can do and how to mitigate the risks and the implications of a misuse of a technology uh, and the fact that I was working here in Israel uh, already in the realm of uh, Israeli technologies and innovations and seeing all the all the uh, amazing innovations that are coming at a, a, such a huge uh, uh, speed as well uh, and already making an impact in Israel and abroad. So it really was a, a no-brainer that we have to map them. And once we saw the, uh, you know, just the, the sheer volume of, of and, and uh, variety of solutions, uh, we believed that it would be of interest also for leaders of other governments and other um, other people in our network to see and be inspired by, what, by what's happening. Great. We have a couple of questions coming in about uh, cooperation between the public and private sectors, between the university sector. Is that something you can, could speak about and in terms of, of funding, perhaps, as well? Um, so I think the funding side of things were, uh, was less uh, public. Uh, I can tell you that I know mo a lot of the funding came from uh, the, the bodies that were driving these innovations or that were hosting them. So the Ministry of Defense uh, R&D unit was uh, in charge of funding of a lot of them. Uh, a lot of them were also working pro bono uh, in, in terms of the initiatives. A lot of times uh, people were just calling and saying, I want in, I want to help, I want to become a part of the team. Uh, the Ambovent uh, uh, case that I've uh, presented is is pretty much the same. Uh, they also um, been involved with Microsoft uh, specifically. So a few international companies have, uh, have pulled in and uh, um, been looped in either uh, proactively or been approached to, to help with the funding. And also, as I said, the Innovation Authority have, has given quite a lot of money to help speed up um, these uh, products, uh, both R&D and time to market. Um, that was very, that is very important in, in uh, the case of a pandemic. Great. Here's a question uh, from Michael Fleischman. Uh, if, in what COVID response technology areas does Israel have true advantages relative to other countries? How might the U.S. consider cooperating with Israel in health technologies? So I would say digital health. Uh, you all saw the, the, um, the very impressive map of 180 companies just in health tech. Um, I think the solutions coming out of that are uh, very inspiring and all of them are looking to collaborate with the US because Israel is such a tiny market, uh, uh, obviously, and obviously because the ties are so, uh, are so strong and the, also the relations between the Israeli um, the, F, the, the, F, the American FDA and the Israeli authority uh, for that is very close. So once you get a, a product approved for use in Israel or in the States, it, it, uh, they rely on each other uh, very much. So I think collaboration is uh, already happening. It needs to happen more. I think um, 
uh, obviously uh, companies being proactive in uh, reaching out uh, should play a game, but also uh, public sector and dip uh, diplomats uh, that are doing a lot of the work I know uh, around the world in India and in Africa, uh, a lot of work is being done through uh, diplomacy as well. Great, Mayor. I know it's something that you and I had, had spoken about uh, together about uh, how Israeli innovation on COVID is uh, potentially Im improving diplomacy with some co some countries. Uh, could, could you expand upon that a little bit more, please? Yes. So um, I, I am a great believer that uh, tech is a bridge uh, and can act as a bridge between people and uh, countries. Um, I'll, I'll start by sharing something personal. I worked for Google. I was based in Dublin. Uh, it, it's the headquarters of uh, EMEA. So I had uh, the pleasure of working with people from all around the world. And when you are placed with in, around the same table with people from even people that you don't even know or people from neighboring countries that you grew up supposing to hate or saying they are my enemy and being connected over technology and ideas and research and innovation uh, creates such a strong tie and opens up the discussion the, and, and opens up the heart. And I believe that uh, that is the way. And I think that technology in general can play a huge part in that. Um, I think one of uh, the biggest examples that we've seen recently in terms of Israel uh, collaborating with uh, a country doesn't have uh, diplomatic ties is a recent publication that uh, two uh, private uh, companies uh, from Israel have signed with two private companies in the UAE, um, which is a first. Uh, I'm not saying it's a first that the business in, is being done, I don't know, but it's the first time definitely that it's being publicized. Um, it's not yet a diplomatic um, occasion. It's still very much an, uh, an R&D um, collaboration, but I do believe that once that type of normalization of, uh, of uh, business ties happens, it's uh, definitely uh, opening up the way for more diplomatic uh, discussions as well. And I, I know that vaccines and treatments weren't directly covered in, in your report, but could you give maybe just a very broad overview on the on the vaccine conversation happening in Israel now? Um, yes. So to the best of my knowledge, there are six uh, prominent uh, initiatives at the moment. Uh, three of them are uh, private companies or semi-private companies. And... Um, and three of them are research universities. So um, one company or an institute rather that it belongs to uh, the government in a way is the Israel Institute for Biological Research. Um, I know that they are the most advanced in terms of uh, developing their vaccines and they have uh, already done animal testing on uh, hamsters. And the most recent finding was that their testing was uh, successful on the hamsters and they were able to show uh, their, their uh, solution, sorry, is based on antibodies. So they were able to show that by intake of the antibodies, um, the hamsters were able to uh, protect themselves and fight the disease. Um, so that is that one it was interesting. There's another one that is more built on uh, the subunit of the vaccine, as it's called, uh, which contains pieces of the coronavirus protein. It's not the actual virus, but the protein of it. And uh, they've recently uh, raised um, twelve million dollars uh, to develop their research, and they are hoping to uh, start clinical trials by this summer. Uh, these are the two most most advanced ones. Um, and there's another company uh, working based, the solution is based on algae. Uh, so help, that algae is helping uh, the, the um, for lack of a better word, the, the, photosynthesis, uh, the photosynthetic organism go through the body and uh, help, uh, help the immune system uh, through that. So two that are working to, uh, with the immune system and one that is working uh, with the protein of the, of the virus itself. 
Um, on the research done by the universities, there's less information, but I can tell you that two of the big universities working on uh, vaccines have already uh, signed deals and for collaborations with international companies. Uh, so the Tel Aviv University has signed with uh, Neovi. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. It's a Swiss-based pharmaceutical company. And the Bar Ilan University is working in collaboration with a Swedish pharmaceutical company called Dassault's Lab. Um, so there's uh, hopefully good news to come. Great, we hope so. Question uh, here from a supporter. How does the level of COVID innovation in Israel compare to that in other countries? Uh, so, um, I think the level of Israeli innovation in general is quite high. Um, I believe we are still, uh, in terms of um, people per startups, uh, still one of the high highest uh, in the world. I, I think the, the last number was a startup for every 2,000 people. Um, so that's quite impressive in general in terms of the, uh, the volume. Uh, but also the innovation in terms of its ingenuity is quite impressive, I would say, because there, is, uh, there are a few factors that are very much uh, uh, unique to Israel um, that enable that innovation in a, in a fast, flexible way uh, and, and very much being able to act quickly and, and readiness uh, both to adapt the innovation, but also to work together in collaborations like we've seen uh, on some of these initiatives. So working in this collaboration that really helps move quickly, but also inform each other from different sectors. And so the, the products are better from the get go, because if you combine health professionals with security professionals, with uh, engineers working on software, uh, with researchers and, and policymakers, then you look at the, the entire ecosystem or the entire value chain of a, a specific product problem, and then the level is, uh, I believe, higher. Um, and in COVID, um, I just read, I think two days ago, that Israel is third in the amount of uh, and volume of uh, products out already, and it's third uh, to uh, United States and China. So just looking at the size of the country, I think it says a lot. Wow, that's very impressive. Can you share some of the specific success stories where Israeli innovation on COVID has, has made an impact for the better? Um, sure, I, uh, there's one story of one company that is uh, dear to my heart. I really believe in, in their innovation. It's quite uh, difficult to explain, so I encourage you to go to their website and, and look for uh, more uh, information about the company. But uh, in terms of uh, what they did and uh, what they offer in general is uh, they are an AI powered problem solving platform. It sounds very vague and it is, uh, but basically what they do, they take any data you input into the system, uh, either proactively or it can also collect every publicly available data, uh, analyze it, add hypotheses to it, check those hypotheses and come back with insights. Um, it's an amazing power and amazing tool. They're working across sectors, but for COVID especially, uh, one success story that I found uh, quite remarkable, um, this company uh, Spark Beyond has uh, offices around the world in uh, five locations, if I'm not mistaken. And they started working with the government of Singapore uh, way back in February. Um, and um, the, their success story is that by February 22nd, they were already able to provide insights to the Ministry of Health of the Singapore uh, government uh, showing them the three hotspots of the spread of the virus, one of which in, uh, included the uh, famous Life Church story that uh, started the entire spread of the disease around the country. So basically getting those insights in time, even before they started with lockdowns, enabled the, uh, the Singaporean uh, government to make better communication uh, better communicate to their uh, citizens what's happening, uh, what's going to happen, uh, made 
make them, uh, enable them to make better decisions about how to do lockdowns and where to do lockdowns and also plan their exit strategy. Uh, and although they're now like everyone else in the world are experiencing a second wave, it's, it's quite a low second wave. And I believe they're still considered uh, one of the safest countries um, in the world today, I think number four or five. So I believe this is a great success story of the power of AI and problem solving and the way that uh, complex uh, you know, platforms that we don't even understand and are able to explain in simple words can make such an impact uh, on everything from pandemic spread to uh, insurance, to banks, to uh, healthcare in general. We have a question uh, maybe from, from Mark Gerstein. Uh, I know you've, you've done some work in Africa. Has much of this technology made its way there? Um, so one of the problems, I'll, I'll use that word, uh, with getting some of the technologies to Africa beyond the ones that are open source and, uh, and low tech is the fact that there's a problem of connectivity. Uh, and mobile data usage. So things that seem to be obvious for us to have Wi-Fi or even to be able to make a phone call or have mobile data is not the case in many of the countries, especially in uh, the rural areas. Um, so yes, there are a few companies that are working uh, and a few Israeli companies already um, implementing some of their innovations. Uh, there are also companies that help mitigate this problem using various um, technologies to make uh, online, offline, if you will, uh, using uh, various uh, technologies to, to reduce the need of uh, internet connection or even mobile data. Um, but uh, the initiatives like the Ambivent that we saw of the, um, the ventilation support device uh, is something that is uh, being now um, checked in, uh, in Africa, across Africa, in a few countries, there are a few teams working to develop their own uh, prototype, and also a few countries interesting in starting to either produce or assemble uh, their own uh, their own model of the device. Okay. Uh, here's a question about uh, masks, and we'll we'll see uh, if if uh, we we can uh, be helpful or not. But uh, Roger Loria says, I've used the Synovia face mask, but its mm -hmm. penetration in the population is limited. He's a Dr. Roger Loria, virologist. If you have any insights on that. Um, so how they can penetrate the, the, the population more? Is that the question? Well, That's I think- uh, I think they're only at the start of their uh, way. Uh, they just got, uh, they just started uh, international shipping about, I think about a month ago, don't hold me to it. Um, but I believe that uh, with time and with more purchase, purchases around the world, they will also be able to reduce the, the cost of the, of the mask. And that will definitely help uh, in making it a more of a household, uh, um, product. I think we'll do one or two more questions. And if folks have any more, please do go ahead and submit it in, in the Q&A feature. And Memrav, you talked in your presentation about contact tracing. Can you Could you talk a little bit more about how that works and, and how you maybe even see that uh, ex improving and maybe even being more utilized more widely in the future? Yeah. Um, so as I said, I think I mentioned uh, earlier, What's really important about these voluntary contact tracing apps is, uh, adapt is ad adoption and uh, usage. So having people uh, just download the app and allowing the access um, to, to be used, uh, access to their um, you know, location history, which I understand is a, is a privacy concern uh, for a lot of people and a lot of governments are very much afraid to use it and it's totally understandable. There are ways to mitigate uh, these problems, but it's mostly to do with, um, I would say, with education of the public on the importance of it because the most important thing is to get, uh, the, to get a high number of people using it 
experts say around 70% for it to be uh, very effective. And at the moment, I don't know of any country uh, and any democratic country, I would say that has more of a, more than 20% usage. Um, so education on the importance of it, I would say, and mitigating the privacy risks uh, that are concerning a lot of people would be the best way to get it uh, to be more widespread uh, um, used uh, in, pop in the population. Um, and there are other ways um, that governments are starting to adapt to like uh, smart watches and other types of uh, tracking and surveillance for lack of a better word um, that are all also used. But again, these privacy concerns is the one thing that needs to be addressed in order for uh, the contact tracing uh, power, uh, digital power of contact tracing to really make an impact. And as a final question, I love so fortunate and grateful to have you with us today and, and really appreciate your insights. What did you find especially interesting or meaningful about, about the report and your time working on it? Um, so I would have to say um, you started off with, uh, with a question on collaboration and it's nice to end it also on collaboration because I think that is the, the thing that strike me most is the the, the amount, the sheer volume of and types of uh, various collaborations. And, you know, Israel is considered the uh, startup nation. And I think uh, post COVID, it can definitely be uh, renamed as the collaboration nation of, uh, of startups and technology. Um, you know, having these multi teams work and, and the way they work as well, which is another thing that is quite unique, I believe, to Israel is the flat hierarchy of it. Uh, so the flat hierarchy that really enables people to work uh, quickly and uh, directly with each other and uh, get to these results uh, so quickly uh, that the cockpit uh, uh, system that we've seen has been uh, developed and running within weeks. Um, uh, some of these uh, models of ventilation support devices have been uh, uh, up and running and tested within a month. So. That I think the, the collaboration really helps. Uh, first of all, it's it's inspiring to see and inspiring to see that the how different people from different sectors can work together so well. And it's inspiring to see how good of products they can uh, they can then produce together. Thank you so much, Mirav. I'm gonna uh, hand it over to Mark Melman, DMFI president. Thank you, Thanks Rachel. very much, Rachel and Mayrav. Thank you so much for a really extraordinarily insightful and important uh, report that you put out and a presentation to us that we're very, very grateful for. Obviously, part of the goal of the uh, Democratic Majority for Israel is to strengthen the U.S.-Israel relationship, particularly within the Democratic Party. One of the ways in which we think it's important to strengthen that relationship is to make it clear that that relationship is really about a lot more than just uh, important as it is, conflicts with the Palestinians, or military and strategic issues, there's a great deal more to this relationship. Uh, and I think may Rob underline many of the important uh, aspects that do underlie this relationship that are uh, really quite different from what we usually see in the headline. So again, we're grateful for that. Um, just uh, for those of you that are, uh, are uh, consistent uh, uh, supporters and people interested in our work, uh, that work continues. Uh, as you know, uh, we have been deeply engaged in the uh, democratic platform process, uh, which is coming to a close. Uh, where it's in a very good place, uh, thanks to the work that, uh, that all of you have done uh, through DMFI and elsewhere. Uh, so that's a very, very good, uh, important success that we're gonna be racking up. Uh, DMFI PAC, our separate sister organization, uh, continues to uh, help uh, candidates uh, win elections. Uh, we've won about 17 so far, lost one, and the one we're still waiting for a decision on. Uh, so DMFI PAC is continuing its work to make sure that we support the pro-Israel Democratic candidates. And obviously, as we turn to November, we're gonna have a very, very important set of races uh, from the top of the ticket, Joe Biden down to uh, uh, congressional and the Senate level as well, uh, where we'll be working very hard to protect pro-Israel Democrats uh, and to advance the interests of, of new pro-Israel Democrats who can be joining uh, in the Congress. So lots of continued activity on lots of different fronts. Uh, but again, we're so grateful to Mayrav for such a wonderful presentation and for really making clear 
the many bases on which we need and should have a strong U.S.-Israel relationship. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike.